Welcome to the Regulatory Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi. I'm the faculty chair of the Regulatory Policy Program at the Mosavar Rahmani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. While we wish we could all be together for lunch in Bell Hall uh, for our regular seminar series, we're going to make the most of our online experience uh, doing our seminar series this semester as a Zoom webinar. Uh, we have a fantastic schedule for you this uh, semester. Uh, let me show uh, the schedule for you here. Uh, of course, today we have uh, our colleague Malcolm Sparrow, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, we'll meet again in two weeks with Richard Lazarus of the Law School uh, to present some of his work uh, looking at the 2007 Massachusetts versus uh, EPA uh, Supreme Court climate change ruling. Uh, we'll meet again in later in October, where we have the former chair of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Cheryl LaFleur, speaking about uh, decarbonization strategies for the United States. Uh, we'll meet in late October with Kathy Craninger, the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, with her thoughts on current priorities in consumer financial protection. We'll have Michael Fitzpatrick, who is the head of global regulatory affairs at, at Google, speak some about AI and digital policy uh, in the coming decade. And our last seminar of the semester will be with Chris Brummer, a professor at Georgetown University Law Center, who will be addressing the question about uh, the absence of black financial regulators uh, in the context of US financial uh, regulation. So we have, a, I think, a really exciting schedule for you uh, this semester, um, but uh, thrilled uh, today to have with us our colleague, uh, Malcolm Sparrow. Uh, professor Sparrow is a uh, professor of the practice of, uh, of public management here at the Kennedy School. Uh, Malcolm has some fascinating real world experience having served for 10 years with the British Police Service, rising to the rank of Detective Chief Inspector. He is also dead serious at tennis and he won his match this morning as we heard <laughs> as we were getting ready uh, today. Um, let me talk a little bit uh, before uh, we get started. Also, though, I need to comment on the logistics for our seminar. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to type through the Q&A function in the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, for questions for Malcolm throughout the seminar. I will be fielding and synthesizing questions and presenting them to Malcolm. Uh, so uh, feel free to add uh, any questions that you have there. And at the end of Malcolm's presentation, we'll get to uh, that Q&A. Um, if you know someone who's interested in today's talk, but they were busy right now, or maybe they're in another time zone, let them know that we're recording this seminar. We will post it on the Regulatory Policy Seminar website, and they can access uh, this seminar uh, that way. Um, Malcolm has been a, an engaged and frequent attendee of the Regulatory Policy Seminar series over the years, so it's great to have him now as a speaker. Uh, in the seminar series. He's going to present uh, to us uh, some insights from his recently published book, The Fundamentals of Regulatory Design. Uh, so Malcolm will make a presentation. He'll have, stay engaged. He's going to have some questions for you in addition to you having questions for him. So you'll have some opportunities to fill out a few Zoom surveys over the course of his presentation. Um, but with this, I'd like to turn the floor virtually over to Malcolm for his presentation. Malcolm, welcome back to the Regulatory Policy Seminar. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, thank you, Scott, for inviting me to come spend this time telling you a little bit about this uh, new book. Um, and, and I must say I'm uh, grateful to anybody that has showed up, um, which is over 50 people for this uh, seminar, because I gave it the most boring title that I could think of, uh, Fundamentals of Regulatory Design. Um, and I checked HKS today, uh, the website this morning, and saw that there were seven separate seminars all running at the same time, starting at noon today. So I know you're all spoiled for choice. And um, I assume you must really care about regulation, uh, practice and policy in order to be uh, with us today. Um, and actually this book has a, a, a boring title because uh, it's not intended for academics. Um, academics, they, you have to have something natty and a bit clever. Um, and this is written absolutely for regulatory practitioners, um, the professionals that do the work um, and who are, whose lives are not so much studied, practice is not so much studied as regulatory policy by academia. Um, and I wanted a title that actually makes it uh, obvious to them. This is essential. This is stuff that affects everybody. 
Uh, there's no escape. Um, you've got to think through a whole bunch of basic uh, design puzzles to understand not only where your agency is and what is its uh, legacy, what is its current practice, but what are the opportunities for future development if you get the opportunity to uh, wriggle a little bit from the, from the current position. Um, so I, I'm going um, to sort of lay out uh, very quickly some of the puzzles that I present in this book um, just to see if they interest you and I might tease you a little bit with some poll questions to see um, then they all look on their face unbelievably obvious but then when you poll people people think quite different things about them so there's at least something to discuss um, if the results are not unanimous. Um, this book is uh, it's my pandemic book um, it's not about the pandemic, but it's written because of the pandemic. I'm sure there will be tens of thousands of academic books written in precisely this period because academics are non-essential workers and they're required to stay home. So what to do? I, I, I'm sure you all remember March the 13th, Friday this year. It was the last standing up teaching day at the Kennedy School. And it was the last day of my one week executive program on regulatory practice. Um, so, you know, we got through that week um, with a lot of chaos going on in the background. And then uh, once that class had gone home, 2 p.m. on Friday, the 13th, the uh, university shut down. The, the word was de-densification of the campus, which meant go home. Um, I spent the next two weeks uh, cancelling things. Uh, I had to cancel two trips to Australia, one trip to the Netherlands, a whole bunch of classes and courses and seminars inside the US. Um, and I actually did a little calculation uh, for uh, the remainder of March, April, May and June. Um, I had uh, 162 hours of classroom teaching booked, all of which just vanished. And I thought, well, what, what, on, what on earth should I do for all of those people that I'm now not going to meet? Most of them regulatory practitioners, um, various countries around the world. And I thought, well, actually, in, it, just in the teaching time, 162 hours, I can write a book in that time. Um, I could write down a good piece of what I would have told them, at least the basics, the essentials that everyone has to think through before we get to the interesting stuff, which is diagnosis of your agency. Um, and your current uh, challenges and aspirations. Um, and so I did this instead, uh, and it's deliberately constructed as an alternate to lectures. So it's written in a conversational style. Um, at each chapter, after presenting the basic concepts, it has a frequently asked questions section. At, so you read through this, you're like in the discussion. Then it has a diagnostic exercise. Um, you know, you want to apply this to your own agency. Well, here's the questions that you probably should run through with your colleagues and write something down. See what it shows you. Uh, each of these, you know, chapters is a conceptual device that you can drop on your regular operation and see if it reveals anything uh, interesting or important um, to you. So that's that's the nature of the beast. Uh, it's not designed for an academic audience. I know we have a lot of academics in this audience. It is designed absolutely for the regular practitioners um, and is therefore a little bit of an unusual object. I wanted it published uh, soon and quickly, so I did it myself. Um, Cambridge University Press wanted to put it in you know, the textbook section, but they wouldn't use my glamorous front cover. They wanted to use their own thing called elements. It looked incredibly dull. It would have taken six months at least, and there would be no royalties. Um, so that wasn't a good idea. Uh, Brookings, who published The Regulatory Craft, my main book 20 years ago, they were interested too, but they, they seemed paralyzed uh, by the uh, pandemic in terms of getting anything done. So I did it myself through um, Amazon and Kindle Direct Publishing. I'd never done that before. It's actually an extraordinary experience, which I'm prepared to answer questions about if you're curious. Um, as soon as you deliver the files in the end, um, there it is available all over the world within 10 hours. Um, it's uh, really, you know, it's, it's surprisingly straightforward um, and uh, very curious um, thing. If you're, used, if you're used to academic publishing, this is the complete antithesis of it. 
Um, and there's no downside because um, you can withdraw a book anytime and you retain the copyright. So, <laughs> so you know, once the pandemic is done, I can take it back and do something different with it if I want. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a downside. And what I did want is to have this material available as uh, asynchronous uh, work assignments for online courses um, where you can actually assign one or another of these subjects. Um, so now I'm going to do a dangerous thing and try and share PowerPoint slides with you. Um, some, somebody must tell me if this actually works. Yes, can you see the front cover? It looks good, Malcolm. Okay, so um, yeah, notice that on this uh, Wheel of Fortune, notice the big black uh, thing you don't want to land on, regulatory failure, it all goes wrong. Uh, thinking of FAA today, or as of yes, publication of the report yesterday on the uh, Max 8 debacle. Um, but there, there are no shortage of ideas about how practitioners should operate. And I just listed like 22 of them here on the cover. Um, what's it about? Um, well, actually very, uh, the alternate title that I almost used was what is, it, what is a risk-based regulator and would you like to be one? Um, because that's vogue vocabulary in the practitioner world these days, but there are at least a dozen different meanings of what risk-based regulation means. And of course, risk-based regulation is ambiguous because that might be a, a, around the law itself. And I'm focused on the, the practitioners. And the practitioners inhabit this strange space between the law as enacted and uh, protections as delivered to society. They're in between. Um, and I believe that they have an extraordinary range of um, uh, choices as to how they organize themselves and what they focus on when they use the law and when they use other devices instead um, in order to, to protect society. Um, this whole subject is also open to people who don't work for government and don't think of themselves as regulators. Anyone that is in the risk control business, um, all of these uh, basic design dilemmas apply to any risk management task also. That's a case that I made much more formally in the character of harms 2008 um, in a much more academic uh, way um, but uh, you know since then uh, we have a lot of people come on the um, executive programs for regulators um, who are not regulators um, they are often professional board members um, they you know an eminent surgeon by virtue of their eminence they've now been put on a professional board but the moment they're on the board, they've got disciplinary um, uh, responsibilities. They're supposed to help protect the public from malfeasance in the profession. Um, they, they are, and they are now a regulator, and they're certainly in the risk control business, and they have no training normally in that, however good a surgeon they were. Um, so this subject, uh, all of these basic analyses, highly relevant for them too. Um, and if you happen to have a background in organizational theory, um, a lot of this is about, well, what organizational theories um, are we applying and using inside large regulatory bureaucracies? Um, the reason there is a subject called organizational theory is because um, job, some jobs are too big for one person. If you've got a one person size job, you don't need any organizational theory. Just do it yourself. Um, but if you've got a massive task to perform, um, then the work has to be defined, divided, handed out, um, conducted, put back together again, hopefully in a way that makes good sense. And so we have functional uh, units inside regulatory agencies. We have process-based units inside uh, regulatory agencies. Um, more and more, we now have risk-based or problem-centric work developing a uh, different set of competences. And there's always the um, possibility of crisis response. Um, so four very different types of work being done. They need different organizational um, governance mechanisms. They, they each have their own set of performance metrics relevant to that kind of competence. Um, and all of this happening inside one agency. So, so you begin to get a sense, actually the life of the practitioner is rich and complicated. Um, and I spend forever apologizing to them um, for academia's failure generally to recognize the complexity of their lives um, because we focus so much on the law itself, the legal framework, the cost benefit analysis, the rules that come, the rules that go, 
um, and they do feel a little bit neglected in terms of um, uh, serious uh, analysis and attention. So um, at the moment, the book has five chapters. Another beauty of publishing yourself is you can replace the files anytime you like. Um, I've only done that like 12 times so far. Um, and um, if you make a substantial change, uh, you have to call it a second edition. And then I think you get a different ISBN number. Um, I, it will have seven chapters eventually. I'll probably write two more um, after my current slew of teaching responsibilities is done. Uh, at the moment it has five. These are the core five that I always cover early um, in uh, executive programs. And the first one, um, I'm just going to tell you what they are. There's no right or wrong answer. Uh, these are just dimensions along which you can move one way or the other um, and where you have a history and, and you might have a future which is different. Um, so it's sort of understanding all these five dimensions which are mostly orthogonal to each other. So with permutations and combinations, there's an endless uh, variety um, of ways of operating that a, a regulatory agency could choose. Um, this is the first one. This one is not about, um, you know, performance on the pitch. This is the simple question, where's the edge uh, of the court, uh, the field of play, uh, you know, cricket ground, there's a rope all around the edge that marks the field of play. It's not a trivial question for regulatory agencies because there's two sets of um, behaviors that you might seek to control. That circle represents non-compliance, people breaking rules. Um, it might be law, it might be regulations. Um, sometimes it's you know, other forms of uh, guidance that have a binding power. Um, and if you focus on those behaviors, then you are a compliance operation. Of course, you can be more or less artful and you can use enforcement and you can use nudge and you can use uh, positive financial incentives or you can do the work for them. But, but the object is to get people into compliance. Um, and then there's people doing things which are harmful or risky um, notice some of which are illegal. So this is a Venn diagram overlapping sets. It gives you three areas, A, B, C, from left to right. Um, and uh, some folks say, well, you know, Sparrow, you're a bit cynical. Surely our law is better than this. Um, they're lined up better than this. Um, no, you look at, across almost any regulatory field, they're not that terribly aligned at all. Um, I should convince you that the crescents are non-trivial. Um, Region A, uh, you got old rules on the books that you haven't cleared out lately and they're obsolete because technology's moved along and probably you don't enforce them, but they're still there. Um, marginal offense, um, racing driver, very skillful, comes through your village one mile an hour over the speed limit at midnight. No one is perfectly safe, but it's illegal. Kennedy School uh, is obliged to send in forms saying how many people are injured in the classrooms each month, the answer is zero, again, because nearly everyone's sitting down, but the form is a day late. It's a paperwork violation, non-compliant. There's tons of stuff on the left-hand side, and we're always learning about things over on the right-hand crescent, region C, um, because it includes all natural disasters where a government response is required. Pandemics, there's no violation associated with the genesis of that. Um, after the global financial crisis, we learned that structural stability questions in financial markets don't necessarily require a violation uh, by any one bank, any more than flash crashes on stock markets caused by high frequency trading algorithms interacting in strange and unpredictable ways. Somebody has to worry about that. That's in the right hand side to macro prudential supervision or air traffic control. Uh, risks associated with air traffic congestion. That's not about a violation by any one um, airline. So there's plenty of stuff in A, there's plenty of stuff in C. I, I'm not, I think, any more cynical than I need to be about this. Um, and then there's a simple question. Um, which of these regions are your business as a regulator, A, B, and C, and in what order of priority? Um, and everybody's immediately keen to tell me that um, you start in the middle which is obvious, um, region B, because um, 
whatever those risks are, they've already been recognized. They've been through the rulemaking procedure. They're part of your statutory obligation. Therefore, you've probably got funding as well because the funding tends to go with the statutory obligations or authorities. Um, and it's important because it's in the right-hand circle as well. Um, so that's where you would begin. Everybody knows that. Everybody does that. And, and if you want to go back to the Vogue question, what does it mean to be a risk-based regulator? Uh, here's one very simple idea. If you're focused on the left-hand circle, which is called, um, I believe, the legal model of regulation, there's still too many transgressions and violations and you can't deal with them all. So you need an, um, a sort of arbitrage system. You need a, a way of evaluating each one, figure out which, which ones go criminal, which ones go civil, which ones go warning, and which ones do you ignore. Well, here's one basis for evaluating transgressions. Um, what is the actual or potential harm involved? Perfectly plausible basis for prioritizing transgressions. It's not the only one because it doesn't address culpability or deliberateness or repeat offenders. You know, justice ideas and morality is a different basis. Um, but the magnitude of the potential harm or actual harm caused perfectly plausible. That's the easy part with this puzzle. Um, but it's the next piece, which is a bit harder. Um, okay, suppose you've done everything in Region B and you've got five hours a week left over. Um, you know, you and all of your colleagues. Are you going to go left to Region A and do more compliance work? Or are you going to go right um, to Region C and do more harm uh, reduction? risk control, whatever language you want to apply there. Um, and that's a bit of a puzzle. And my first poll is going to ask you that question, a particular form of that question, just to see if it's obvious to everybody which is the right answer. Um, but before I give you a poll or ask you to vote or anything like that, I have to warn you, whichever way you go, you're going to get insulted. It's just that the insults are quite different. If you go to the left, and start enforcing rules that don't have any consequence that the public can see. Now uh, they'll call you obsolete, unreasonable, nitpicky bureaucrat, nothing but a barrier to economic prosperity. And if they hadn't had a, a red tape reduction movement lately, they'll launch one in your honor. But if you go over here on the right, what will they call you? They'll say you're unauthorized. You're going beyond your mandate. This is mission crit. Or, or they might even call you a mission creep. Or in America, they say unconstitutional or undemocratic. Didn't you study public administration? Don't you know that it's up to the legislature to figure out the rules? Your job, executive, is merely enforce them. And if you do a good job of compliance management and there's a pile of dead bodies over there or insolvent banks or crashed airplanes, that's not your problem. That's a defect in the legislation. You might point it out to the legislature. Um, that's a different view. And I, and I put in the word entrepreneurship just to provoke you here. And, you know, what about exploring unexploited business segments, chances to identify risks and control them, even though no one gave you that job? That's the positive view of mission creep. So, um, I'd like you to imagine yourself, you're, in a, you're a regulatory official, uh, you're a professional, and you're facing that choice. You've done everything in Region B, you've got five hours a week left over, and I'm not going to give you the easy option, I do a bit of each. No, I want you to say, what's the right choice, Region A or Region C? Uh, Victoria, please pull up poll number one. So uh, and look at the wording of the question, it's really quite deliberate. Given this choice between regions A and C, what is the right thing for a public official to do oh, in a democracy? Fire away. Um, we're going to wait until, like most of you have voted, what is the right thing to do in a democracy? We're up to halfway. Keep coming. We keep coming, 58% voted. And we give you five more seconds. I mean, the answer is becoming quite apparent. Two, three, four, five. Okay, thank you. Uh, Victoria, can you close the poll and show the answers? It's like two to one. 
uh, basically two thirds region C to one third region A. Now, from my point of view, um, the good news here, it's not unanimous. And it's not even unanimous if you are all from one agency. People are all over the place on this question. And this is a pretty simple, straightforward question. So there's something to be done here in terms of figuring out where are we? What do we really think we're about? Um, I want to, uh, can we relaunch this poll? Um, and I'm, this time I'm gonna say, please lawyers only. Lawy I don't know how many lawyers we have in the group today, but I, I'm sure we've got some. Um, Victoria, please relaunch the poll and lawyers only, if we have any. Please vote. Right, I think that's not quite settled. So again, Malcolm, uh, one quick question. Uh, it's to be clear here that you're saying if you have additional time to work, Yes. You focus your initial efforts as a regulator on the obvious area in the middle. Yep. And so the question is, do you spend more of what you call region A, which is that area to our left that's illegal, yep. or more on what you're calling region C, which is to the right of what's harmful? Yes, harmful, but probably not recognized yet in law. So uh, uh, Victoria, thank you. Close this poll and show the results. Um, okay, I, uh, this, we have very unusual lawyers in this group. Um, uh, if I do this with uh, an agency and you've got the general counsel's office represented there, and actually I did this with uh, 109 Australian regulators last week, all the lawyers are voting for Region A as a general rule. They are incredibly nervous about going into Region C and for very um, good reason. But we got a two to one uh, Region C to Region A. Um, uh, Victoria, uh, please pull up the next poll, uh, poll number two. This is a slightly different version of the question. Uh, so poll two. So poll two says, um, given this choice, what would you as a professional regulator prefer to, to do? So we're sort of de-emphasizing the democracy piece now. And boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, the question is, does it change your vote at all? And if so, why? Um, okay, I think that's enough time. Uh, Victoria, thank you very much. And show us the results. Uh, and um, what you notice is that it shifts substantially to the right. We're at 90%, 10%. Uh, um, I have one more version of the question. Um, poll number three, please, uh, Victoria. This is um, not what you want to do as a professional, but what do you think the public wants? Um, this is actually an odd question to ask in the American political environment. Okay, um, so yes, please show us the results. Um, again, it's uh, shifted to the right um, quite substantially. It hasn't shifted quite as far as the, the second version of the question. What you should know is that in most other countries, it shifts almost all the way to 100% uh, Region C. Um, there is a political ideology, um, some parts of the uh, US community that, that wants small government at all costs. Um, part of a you know, ideological um, uh, belief, and therefore um, uh, they're going to vote for Region A. Um, it's curious when you look at these three versions of the question that what you'd like to do and what you think the public want uh, seem to be somehow constrained by democracy. Uh, because when we put democracy and your obligations to democracy into uh, the question, um, then we get a slightly more conservative uh, response. Uh, thank you very much. You can put this uh, poll away for now.
Um, and uh, I'm not going to um, tell you that there's a right answer. Uh, there isn't. Um, we are in a period when almost all regulators um, want to move to the right and um, arguably are already working in the expert domain. In fact, if you give practitioners a little while, very simple diagnostic question, do you deal with issues that, aren't, that don't involve violations? And the answer within 10, 15 minutes, almost anywhere is yes, except tax administration. Arguably, tax agencies don't have the right hand present. Their job is to get compliance with the tax policy, uh, tax law. The law is set above their heads up in the um, legislative committees or the uh, Ministry of Finance. Um, but everyone else is already doing this and they usually don't realize that they're doing it. And the lawyers are nervous about it. I and mean, so we are in a period when, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, which we can't go into today, we are moving to the right towards the expert model. Um, but even those that operate that way don't seem to embrace it or understand it explicitly. And their stakeholders don't necessarily agree. Um, and so my advice then is if you choose to do this, which of course is up to you, make sure that you do it deliberately and that you understand the consequences and that you communicate that choice to everyone that needs to know, including the journalists and the industry um, and the politicians. Um, because if you embrace the expert model, it changes everything about regulatory conduct from start to finish. It will surely change the data that you gather because you're interested in stuff happening here, even if it's not covered by a law. Um, it'll change the analyses that you conduct because you're interested in patterns and trends and clusters of harm, whether or not they lie to the left or right of this particular line. It will surely change the range of professional skills that you hire people for and that you um, value in-house and promote for because all the other ways of dealing with risks that don't involve compliance operations, education, outreach, voluntary guidance, part, uh, partnership programs, naming and shaming people in the press, raising awareness, all of these things count here um, because there's so much can be done even if the law doesn't cover it. Um, and at the end of the year, um, you, it'll transform your performance report. Annual performance report, if you're in the legal model, is mostly about compliance activities. And the eventual outcome, if you know how to measure it, is compliance rates achieved. Um, the annual report here is much more problems that you saw, risks that you understood how you knew about them, what you did, what happened as a result, and whether you can or can't declare them to be sufficiently controlled or now better controlled than they were before. That's puzzle number one. Um, and if you'd like a longer conversation about that, that's chapter one in the book. Puzzle, puzzle number two. Oh, um, diagnostic questions for that one are, is your agency already operating in the expert model? Um, does everyone understand the implications if you are? And do your outside stakeholders understand? Uh, if you're interested in these diagnostic questions, there's a downloadable file from my website on this. So the address will be on the slides. Um, you can download a Word file that has all the diagnostic questions so that if you want to, you can go through and fill it in. Number two, um, here's a slide I created um, for a talk at the Kennedy School to the faculty in 2008. It caused mayhem amongst uh, Kennedy School faculty. It's such a simple thing. There's bad beds down the left-hand column and there's goods down the right-hand column. Um, as far as I could find them uh, in the English language, you know, countervailing goods um, like the antonym where more of the left is less of the right and more of the right is less, less of the left. Um, and that, you know, begins to look like, and these, these are social harms down the left-hand side of one kind or another, some of which don't involve violations. Um, disease, poverty um, generally don't involve violations, uh, but they are nevertheless risks to be controlled. So this just illustrates the fact that all of this analysis applies in the risk control business generally. Um, but I'm not interested in the semantics. I'm interested in the organizations and what they do. 
So let's uh, imagine a, a zero-based design opportunity. Uh, you're going to pick one of these things in the left-hand column in some jurisdiction that hasn't paid much attention and create a new agency. Um, and, and I'm going to be generous. I'll give you a budget of $100 million a year. Uh, so you can hire about 1,000 people of any type, any type you like. You can hire researchers and publish papers. You can hire ex-cops and do enforcement if you think you can get away with it. You can um, run a licensing system and attach conditions to permits or licenses to get, you can do anything you like. Um, question, as you design a brand new operation with a thousand people on a big budget, does it make any difference to what you will construct if you focus on the bads to be identified and reduced or if you focus on the goods on the right to be identified and promoted or extended? Simple question. And people have the most extraordinary set of responses to this. Um, and, and I think logical to say either it makes a difference or it doesn't. Um, if it does make a difference, we should figure out you know, what difference does it make and then which side do we prefer, if we prefer one side. If it doesn't make a difference, then I don't know, does the language count? Um, or, or are we wasting our time with this one? Um, so let's, uh, let's get your initial reaction. I should apologize for the fact that these are not perfect antonyms. Um, but I'd like you to, if you can, imagine that they are perfect antonyms. I think the one that comes closest to being perfect is highway accidents and highway safety. Does it make a difference if you want to identify and reduce highway accidents or if you want to uh, promote highway safety or is it in fact the same operation? Let's have poll number four, please, uh, Victoria. Does the choice between focusing on promoting goods or controlling bads make a practical difference to operations or is it merely cement? So the first answer is yes, it makes a difference to operations. Second answer is no, it would be the same in practice. It's just being described in other, in other words, that's two sides of the same coin. Okay, just five more seconds. The answer is pretty clear, but it's not unanimous. Okay. Uh, Vic, if you can take the poll down and show us the results. Um, so like 85 to 15, um, yes, it makes a difference. So a whole bunch of people, 16% um, here yeah, say it's, it doesn't make any difference. Um, I will tell you from um, conversations on this uh, in various parts of academia, it is often microeconomists who say that. Uh, because they have a very mathematical uh, view of the world. Um, it's all about um, utility functions and optimizing them, and we're all rational actors, and we're looking for a policy um, resolution that optimizes uh, you know, our combined utility in some way. And this chart, therefore, means um, less of bads, that's minus times minus, and the right-hand column is plus times plus. It looks like the same. And if you dress all the utility functions up in minus signs and then do the same optimization, you probably get the same answer. So actually it's a, it's a sort of mathematical view of the world that says no difference, but I'm trained as a mathematician. Um, but I deal with practitioners on, and I believe it makes a huge difference. Um, let's just go one step, step further though. Uh, the next poll, um, and don't answer this just yet, because this is only for some of you. Uh, poll number five. Uh, we should be on poll number five. For, so this is for those of you who think the choice does make a difference. That's most in this group. Which, if it does make an operational difference, then which side do you prefer? An operation built around the right or an operation built around the left? Or it's actually not wise to prefer one to the other?
Five more seconds. Okay, let's see the results. Um, those are the results. So of those that want to make the choice, um, it's very strongly uh, prefer to work on the right. Um, and uh, almost half don't want to make the choice. Um, in other words, the choice, I guess, might be contingent on other factors that we haven't discussed or phases in the development of a risk control operation. Um, very interesting. Let's go to uh, poll number six. And this is for those of you who thought that it didn't make an operational difference. Um, then do you, do you have a preference over how you describe the work? If it's merely semantic, is it better to use the language of promoting goods or is it better to use the language of identifying and tackling bears? Or should we not prefer one language over the other? And this will be relatively small numbers um, because there weren't many of you voted for this. Actually, there's more of you, <laughs> I think, now voting than chose that first option. Okay, I'd like to show the results. Um, so a few, a quarter, don't want to make the choice, but of those that do want to make the choice, very heavy preference for the language of the right positive promotion. Uh, I don't know, maybe you have in mind um, research results from behavioral economics. Um, um, it's always curious to me what that strong preference is based on. Uh, thank you, let's put that poll away uh, for now. Um, so here's uh, what I think I know um, from discussing this with a great many different groups. Uh, first of all, I am absolutely convinced that it's a different operation. Um, and when the sort of mathematically inclined say, you know, no, it's not, you're just messing with the signs, Malcolm. Um, I say, well, let me, all I need is a counterexample to blow your theorem away. And my favorite counterexample would be the healthcare sector um, because it's so beautifully differentiated um, into different professions that work in quite different ways. And you know, let's talk about a wellness program over here. It's a big, broad, positive program. It does a lot of good. It contributes to disease control. Um, up the front of a classroom, you've got a nurse or an educator and a group of people at some teachable moment in their lives. And they are discussing healthy lifestyle choices that are within their capacity to make. Um, and this, uh, therefore they're discussing stress reduction and sleep patterns and proper exercise and diet um, and how to protect yourself against certain classes of infectious diseases. Um, all good. Does it contribute to disease control? Yes. Which diseases? Answer, those that happen to be susceptible to this programmatic intervention. Um, and that means cardiovascular health and obesity and obesity related conditions like um, uh, late stage diabetes or, um, or um, mental illnesses, including anxiety and depression um, and uh, hypertension and so on. So meanwhile, there's another group over here. Uh, you know, are the diseases not touched at all by a wellness program? Absolutely. We don't discuss cystic fibrosis in a wellness program. We don't discuss multiple sclerosis normally. We wouldn't typically discuss Ebola, except very strange moments in history when it comes out of the forest and travels internationally. Um, meanwhile, the main group over here focused on diseases is epidemiologists who don't go to the classroom. They work in a lab, they wear lab coats or even hazmat gear on a bad day. Uh, all of them have got microscopes on their bench. Why do they have microscopes? Do they need a microscope for a wellness program? Answer, because they're studying the bats. They're looking mostly at pathogens and viruses and bacteria and disease cells or something that's not working, right? Yes, they look at good stuff too, but only normally for the sake of comparison. 
or they're looking at mosquitoes that carry the Zika virus or capillary systems that support early tumor uh, development. Um, a lot of research in that area at the moment. They absolutely want to know how this bad thing, what it is, how it works, what are its structure and its dynamics, and then they want to find its vulnerabilities so that they can invent creative acts of sabotage to destroy the thing or interfere with it or stop it spreading from place to place or take away some vital commodity it needs to propagate. Um, just as there are poverty traps, according to our own poverty scholars, that don't go away when you promote economic prosperity because they're isolated, they're particular, they're pockets of harm and misery left behind. They're the families that can't appreciate the broader, better economic times. They're the village um, you know, built around a steel mill or a shipyard that closed where there's just no jobs and not enough labor mobility. So poverty traps not touched, not all boats rise with a rising tide, disease is not touched by the wellness program. When you look at the dynamic between these two different types of operation, um, these mostly turn out to be big, broad, positive programs that do a lot of good, should be evaluated to make sure they do. Um, but they're sort of standard, they're broadcast. Um, but there's a different operation, which is to focus on all the pockets of harm and misery left behind when these have done their work. So I, I love physical analogies because they stick in the brain so easily. These are big, broad, proactive or outreach programs often that drive out the tide of harm. But once you've driven out the tide of harm, what do you have left? Assuming uneven topography, um, rock pools all over the place, left behind, all different shapes and sizes. Leave them long enough, so, you know, some of them will swim in, some of them are dangerous, they develop ecosystems um, of their own. And there's a different type of work which involves honing in on the pockets of harm and misery not touched by the big broad program. So I believe they're different operations. Um, and then logically you've arrived, if you accept that, which most of you do, but not all, um, then you've arrived at the, the next question. Well, in that case, which, if they're different, which one do you prefer, wellness programs or epidemiology? And I think most of us for that one would say, uh, they're both valuable. <laughs> We're probably gonna have to do a bit of each. Okay, how much of each? There's now a balance to be struck between two different forms of operation. And many times there's a balance to be struck, simple question, you know, your balance could be off one way or the other. You could be trusting your big broad programs so much, overconfident that they cover everything that you don't even see, let alone can deal with all the things they didn't touch. Or you might be so intently focused on pockets of harm and misery and mopping them up one by one that you miss the opportunity, the efficiencies of grand scale proactive programs. So this is a real puzzle. I, I presented this slide to a, a workshop in, uh, it was Melbourne, Victoria, in Australia um, a couple of years ago. One agency, a curious agency, had a whole range of different environmental responsibilities. And I said, do you know what your balance is? And the woman who was organizing this event said, oh yes, we're like 95% here and about 5% here. And without any prompting from me, she said immediately, and that's not right. Hmm. That was her assessment. It's, not, it's an assessment to be made, agency by agency, make sure you haven't drifted too far one way or other. Um, back to the, you know, the Vogue question, what would it mean to be a risk-based regulator if this is the dimension of choice? Um, where are the risks? They're over here. Um, and I think the, what it would mean is make sure that you have at least some capacity, enough capacity to deal with all the rock pools left behind once the tide's been driven out. Why is it that people prefer this language and sometimes uh, this operation? Uh, if I interrogate individuals who vote this way, uh, uh, often they say, well, I'm, I'm a positive, uh, you know, encouraging person. It, it sort of fits my character. Uh, I, believe by the way it works better. That's a different argument. Um, but often it's, a, um, you know, I like to be here. 
to do this work. Um, to which I would say, I, I like positive, encouraging people. I like to be surrounded by them. I need them. Um, but I don't think your character should determine the structure of the organization. Um, I think it might determine where you belong inside the organization. Um, so anyway, that's what this one is about. Um, and then the issue of labeling, um, could, uh, whether it's better to talk about, you know, we're doing pollution control, again, you know, running enforcement campaigns against industry, or we are promoting environmental stewardship, that is probably political management puzzle. Uh, whatever works best at a particular period and given what happened or didn't happen last week, I don't think the political management, how you describe your work, <laughs> should really affect your organizational design because this should change slowly, carefully, incrementally, once every two, three years at most. This political uh, communication strategy might vary day by day, week by week, depending on what just happened. Um, so they, they need to be decoupled from each other, two quite different principles. Um, that's chapter two, diagnostic questions for this. Malcolm, can I, can I note for you, it is 12.52. We have about eight minutes before we need to wrap up. I'll take 30 more seconds and then be quiet. Okay. What questions do we have? Um, this would invite people to assess the balance. Um, this would invite people to um, uh, try and figure out, is it about right or are they making one of these major errors or one way or the other? Um, let me put away my slides. Um, I have 360 of them. Um, I think I might show you eight. Um, chapter three is about the emergence of craftsmanship um, and, and where that sits in an agency. Um, it, I think craftsmanship comes as the antidote to the pernicious swinging of the regulatory pendulum, term that might be familiar to many of you. Um, and it also comes as an antidote to um, groups that have an ideological preference to be hard and aggressive and enforcement centered versus soft and friendly. Um, chapter four is, a, is where uh, so much of the action is these days. It's about um, developing a problem centric capacity, uh, which is different from functional units or processes um, and how you integrate that into a regulatory agency. And chapter five, um, that's the one that the FAA, FAA should be reading right now. It's about um, how you, uh, when you devolve responsibilities to the industry that you regulate and when it's safe to give them parts of the risk management job. That's the biggest and most and deepest and uh, to me the most alarming piece. Those are my five puzzles at the moment. Um, I'll probably add some more as we go along. Actually, that, that's a lot of stuff that should let you react. Joe, over to you. Great, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, some, some fantastic work for us to, to think about. Uh, wh one quick question, are you gonna do an audible version of your book? Right? So that's- An audible so version. Yeah, so that not only can we read your book uh, online, but will, will you actually read the book uh, as a recording that someone could listen to? Well, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all into learning new media. Okay. Uh, the strange thing is it's sort of written as if it starts with a transcript of a lecture and now you're okay. saying, well, actually, why don't you do the lecture? <laughs> so, so, so let me go back uh, to your discussion earlier about setting the mission. Yes. And I think it gets to this, this question about whether or not regulators have either the um, authority or perhaps have the entrepreneurial spirit to be adaptive to new information about yeah. risk. Yeah. And, and part of it, I think, you know, you noted about what might make us a little bit uncomfortable about a regulator in a democracy going after the harm that's not currently illegal. I think in, in the world that I often work in on environmental policy, we often don't know what future environmental harms are going to be. Yeah. We give a, a criteria that we might want the regulator to use. Yeah. Um, but if, if a new harm satisfies those criteria, we want the regulator to be proactive in tackling that problem. So I, I think in yeah. the air quality context, fine yeah. particulate matter is the worst air pollutant in terms of how it kills people, how it yeah. causes uh, morbidity. Fine particulate matter doesn't show up in the Clean Air Act of 1970. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, but, but it satisfies some of the criteria. So how should we think about ways in which we might want to delegate 
in this case, perhaps from the legislature to the regulator, which I think also has implications for one of your last points about how we might think about the regulator delegating to the regulated, say in the context yeah. of the FAA, how should we think about that relationship to be able to address the emergence of new harms uh, that may not on their face appear to be illegal uh, when we think about the agenda for, for uh, regulatory action? Yeah, two, um, two quick points um, in response to um, that question. Um, the people that say, I, you know, I'm nervous about you going off over here into the expert domain, you know, if a new uh, risk arises, uh, then surely the right thing to do is to go back through the democratic rulemaking process and cover it with the left-hand circle. So this, our solution is always to move the left-hand circle over. And I say, well, you, if you saw it coming, you were already watching in the expert space. Who made that decision? Um, and so you're absolutely right. The whole idea about we expect our regulators to be vigilant and forward-looking and to anticipate things not yet covered, that requires at least monitoring or surveillance in the expert space. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, if democracy holds us back from the thing that we believe is right and want to do and that the public expect, um, the, answer, the answer I believe is, well, go work in the expert space, but you don't do it quietly. You don't do it covertly. You don't do it secretly. You do it with deliberate fanfare and announcement. Look, folks, we see a problem. Here's our data. We, this is how we interpret it. If you see it differently, tell us. It's not really our job, but I can't see anyone else taking it on. If you see somebody else whose job this is, tell us. We've got some creative ideas. This is my proposal right now. If you've got a better idea, please tell us. Um, in other words, you know, by having all of this discussion up front as you proceed gingerly, um, I think you reduce the probability that you'll be facing an injunction to desist later. Um, and you have, in fact, replaced the formal democratic machinery of rulemaking with this operational version of democracy instead. I think that's how you get over the uh, fears about democracy. Great. Uh, you mentioned the FAA. Yes. Um, as some regular attendees of the seminar may recall, we had Christopher Hart, the former chair of the National Transportation Safety Board, visit with us uh, in the Rectory Policy Seminar uh, last fall. Uh, he spoke about autonomous vehicles, something he's quite interested in, but he was doing work evaluating uh, FAA's approach uh, to the Boeing uh, Max 8. Could you speak a little bit more uh, about what the FAA has just sort of announced and sort of what's your, your take on some of the lessons about the relationship between the FAA and Boeing in terms of, of aviation safety? Well, um, the report came out yesterday from the House um, Committee on Transportation and um, Technology. 258 pages. I haven't read all of it yet. I've read most of it. Um, and not much of it is a surprise if you've, for anyone that's been following the MAX 8 thing. Um, the, the real issue in terms of regulatory conduct is um, the degree to which the certification process was delegated back to Boeing. They use this strange thing called authorized representatives. Uh, these are people inside Boeing paid Boeing salaries who are supposed to be working on the FAA's purpose and mission. And we know now as a result of this report um, and investigation that they were discovering things and not telling the FAA, uh, but telling their bosses and their bosses were putting them under enormous pressure um, to a, a keep quiet and b let it go because the uh, performance pressure to get back into production um, get into production soon was overwhelming um, i was involved in a blue ribbon panel to review the conduct of the faa back in 2008 after some other embarrassments um, and what they told us uh, the review panel was you know we're we like the rest of the civil aviation world are entering a new era called safety management systems, which are applied broadly across nearly all transportation modes and other high hazard industries these days. They hadn't finished implementing SMS. There were a lot of questions about how it would be implemented in the US. And they finished, I think in 2012. So, and this is uh, promulgated worldwide by the um, uh, International Organization for Aviation Safety, ICAO. Um, and, you know, they didn't discuss SMS in these hearings. 
first thing I did is search 258 pages of a PDF for SMS or safety management systems. SMS uh, wasn't there. Um, and safety management systems appeared in lower case in one sentence, where, you know, as if it, it just meant ordinary English. No, no, this is an entire, it's a self-regulatory structure where you ask the corporations to do risk identification, uh, design solutions, implement them, and report honestly on whether they dealt with it properly. So I believe, I'm just guessing, I'm imagining that all through the civil aviation world, at the moment, there's incredible nervousness that this investigation would turn out to be a referendum on the use of self-regulation and SMS in particular. And they've avoided that referendum by not mentioning it. That is the principal governing ideology inside FAA at the moment. Well, um, Malcolm, let, let me uh, apologize. We have several questions which I did not have time to get to here, but I uh, appreciate everybody's uh, attendance, uh, their participation in your, your polls. Let me note before we wrap up that we'll meet again in two weeks. Uh, as I noted at the beginning of the seminar, our colleague from the law school, Richard Lazarus, will present on his recently published book, The Rule of Five, about the 2007 Supreme Court climate change case. Uh, you can find the whole schedule. If you go to chat, you'll see the links that our colleague, Victoria Groves Cordillo, put in there. You can click on that to see the seminar schedule and to see recordings of our seminars this, uh, this semester. Um, sometimes we want answers, but I think if you really want to better understand how regulatory policy can be done in practice, having a thoughtful understanding of the puzzles can actually be quite informative, and I recommend uh, that you check out Malcolm's book. Um, and uh, with that, I want to say thank you, Malcolm, for a fantastic seminar to kick us off this semester, and I hope that everybody enjoys uh, the rest of the day, and I hope to see you again here at the Regulatory Policy Seminar in two weeks. Take care. My pleasure. Thank you very much.